We're still in Revelation. We're continuing through this book. How is everybody feeling as, you know, we've gone through this book so far? Feeling all right? Feeling good? Yeah? You know, you're like, yeah, this is okay. Or, wow, this is really crazy. You know, I was thinking this past week. I know, shocker. I was thinking. But um, anyways, like, uh, I was thinking this past week since September till now, like, we have gone through, like, the Holy Spirit, and now we're in Revelation. So we're really hitting the light topics here in our church, and so the topics that can seem to maybe to cause division or, you know, it's lots of opinions and uh, strife. But uh, I hope that, thank you for gracefully, you know, as we've gone through this together as a body, uh, and it's been, I think, really good as we've gone through all these topics. And so, today we're looking at Revelation 5 and all that it brings. Now, Last week, we looked at chapter 4, uh, which brought us the beginning vision of heaven uh, to show us that there is someone on the throne and that heaven, you know, is a present reality, right? It's very real. It's very, it's, it's active right now, but it's also a future one, too, that we look forward to. Now, the key with this book is that it must be read in order. Now, you might be like, no-brainer. Like, that is how books work. We read them in order. Uh, but... Um, well, we read in order because we don't write want to miss the section of the book uh, that will maybe tie everything together, right? If you've picked up a book and you just started reading in chapter 6, you maybe missed a lot or the main thing that's going to tie the whole book together. And so I say we must read this book, right, in order and go through it together because for those who, as we read the Bible, right, I mean, we jump. We jump through the Bible. Like, you know, we read maybe one book and then we jump into a different book. And so, or maybe we read a section of a book and we jump into something different. That's the beauty of the Bible and being alive, that it speaks to us, it leads us, and it guides us because the Holy Spirit that is leading us in the midst of those words. But the thing is, is that with Revelation, we must read it in order. We don't want to miss what this, this one vision is saying to us. And so this vision in Revelation 4 and 5 is the pivotal vision of the book. It is the most important thing within this book. And I know there's lots to still to happen and lots to unfold, but we cannot forget what's going to happen in this section because it will make the rest of the book unintelligible. It will, without the vision of Revelation 4 and 5, especially what we're going to see here today in Revelation 5. And so much of the misinterpretation of the book uh, of Revelation is due to not understanding the visions in chapter 4 and 5. Now, we are going to see today that the Lamb is on the throne, and there is this new song sung to him. That scene is the single most important scene in the whole book of Revelation, that the Lamb is on the throne. That is... oh. That is the most important thing. Everything else must be understood in this light. Everything else. In Revelation, we're actually not being taught a new truth beyond what we were given in the other 65 books of the Bible. We are simply being taught the truth in a new way. That's all. In a new, different way. In a way that will stay with us and transform us. See, Revelation 4 is a powerful summary of the message of the Old Testament. Now, Revelation 5 is going to be a powerful summary of the message of the New Testament. So all, and it's all centered on the Lamb on the throne. And it's all centered on this reigning Lamb. Now, last week, you might have heard the message and heard about, you know, the figure on the throne, Almighty God, and you heard about chaos and a God who is in control. And it, and it might be hard to understand or accept how to define this God of the Old Testament. And I get that. It doesn't always make sense. But along comes Jesus and the New Testament with its Gospels, and it helps us understand what was before us. That is what Revelation 5 is about. It brings clarity to us. It gives us the central thing that we are actually to look at. Without the vision of this lamb on the throne, the vision is just a mess. And so just like if we took Jesus out of the Bible, then the book doesn't make sense. So if last week felt hard or uncomfortable at moments, that's the nature of Revelation 4, reminding us maybe of the OT, reminding us that, that it doesn't feel complete. It doesn't feel complete. And so today we'll bring completeness to the vision of Revelation 4. So now let's hop in to this vision of Revelation 5 here. 
And it says this, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside of it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. So here we are. John has a vision of heaven that begins in chapter 4. He sees the throne. Someone is on it. And images that are around the throne show someone who is powerful, in control, and a reality that heaven's actually not too far off. And now in this vision, John zooms in now on the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. And in this right hand, there is a scroll. Now, the scroll contains what says the full account of what God in his sovereign will has determined for the destiny of the world. So in this scroll, the full account of the destiny of the world. Now, again, seven seals. Again, we've talked about what seven is. Seven is the number of completeness. So the scroll contains the completeness of God's plan. The scroll contains God's plan for rectifying what is wrong and establishing his gracious rule in the earth. Now, the image of the scroll in God's right hand underscores the message of Revelation 4. The living God, ha he has not lost control. The fact that there is a scroll says there is a plan. And the plan is secured and it's held firmly in the right hand of the Almighty. So there's a plan, it's there, it's held firmly in the right hand of the one Almighty. Now, it is the scroll of history. It contains God's plan for establishing his rule on earth. It contains God's plan for bringing the original purpose of creation back to its fulfillment. It contains God's plan for bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. It contains the meaning of history, our world history, your history, my history. It contains it all. And in the midst of that, the angel shouts this, who is worthy to open this scroll and break it? Now, the Almighty God is there, right? It's in his right hand. Shouldn't he be able to do that? Has he got this? Should he be able to execute what's on the scroll? Should he be able to look after the plan, right? And then there's words that then shout, no one is shouted. Now, now that's bad news for John. No one has can do it. That's what he hears. He begins to weep and weep. Just imagine the chaos and pain around him. Just imagine even the chaos and pain in our world and saying, this is it. Heaven is where he longs to be, John. And he, the world feels lost, broken, and no one can execute the plan to save it. So sad news. Like, it's like me telling Jude, you know what? It's bedtime. It's met with weeping. Or when I reach into a snack jar to get my four kids snacks and find out there's only three snacks left. And dad, can you find more? No. It's like we're doing, you know, at Hunger Games to figure out, you know, who's going to get the last snack. Or even the last two weeks, Evie, she has, she's not been feeling great. And so she's woke up crying uh, this past week in the middle of the night for two hours, you know, which is really fun and probably one of my, you know, favorite midnight activities. And so, uh, and I remember sitting in the bed asking her, Evie, like, what can I do to help you? And she's sweeping, nothing, just nothing. <laughs> and so, and she's trying to tell me where the pain's at. And she's like, it's in my cheek. And then it's in my chin. And I'm like, I don't have chin medicine. And so like, <clears throat> what a sobering thought for her though. Sad news. Listen, we as humans, we can build bridges. We can build television sets. We can build spaceships. We can build stealth bombers. We can create and assemble you know, intricate electronic systems like the iPhone. Like we can conceive and produce babies. Uh, but none of us can discover and then implement the secret of history. Having searched the whole universe, this strong angel found no one who had the power or wisdom or moral excellence to break the seals and open the book for humanity. Or even in humanity, he didn't find someone. All that is broken in our world and all that feels lost in our world, it cannot be fixed by us. So John weeps and weeps, and so does our world, right? It weeps. I mean, you can hear the weeping of the world in the music, music even that our world makes. There's pain. Who can fix it? Who has the power? We come again to the heart of the vision, to the heart of the biblical vision of reality. 
And we need to go over it again and again and again until it becomes the heart of our vision, of our reality. And it all comes together here in this next section. And it transforms the way that we are going to understand everything and how we will move throughout this world. And it says this, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to scroll, open the scroll, in its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And this is the heart of the vision. Again, we have to continually go over this even as we move forward in this book until it becomes the heart of our vision, of our reality. And it comes all together here. And it transforms actually the way that we should understand everything. While John weeps, one of the 24 elders who surround the throne, he speaks. And John turns his gaze, you know what, away from the scroll, away from the hand holding the scroll, away from the throne which the one holding the scroll is seated, he turns his gaze towards the elder, and the elder says this, stop weeping. Why? Look. There's that exhortation again in Revelation. Look, look, the lion has overcome. And he's able to open the scroll and it's seven seals. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank God for the lion. And John turns his gaze away from the elder back to the throne now. And so let your imagination be stunned by the surprise. What happens in this part is it's really an amazing part of the vision. John turns expecting to see a lion. Like, wouldn't you? You know what? Wouldn't you expect to see a huge, roaring lion, right? This, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He has triumphed. He's expecting to see a lion. The lion's triumphed. I saw it. I... But then he turns and he sees a lamb as if slain. A lamb. The lion, it's triumphed, yes. He said, I saw a lamb. A slain lamb. What does a lamb have to do with overcoming? What does a lamb have to do with this? A little lamb at that, with seven horns and seven eyes. A real weird lamb. Does Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen Lord, really have seven horns and seven eyes? No, of course not, right? There's imagery within this. Horns are the symbol of strength. There's seven horns, right? Seven, again, the number of completion. This little lamb is completely strong. The eyes are a symbol of wisdom, seven eyes. So this little lamb is completely wise. In the apocalyptic literature of John's day, there is this figure of the warrior lamb that was constantly talked about, this warrior lamb, a powerful lamb that leads the flock of God against an evil beast that was even to be said. And but nowhere in all of the literature are we told how the lamb wins. Nowhere. But then John knows a lamb as if slain. The lamb wins by being slaughtered. The lamb become, overcomes by being sacrificed, by sacrificing himself. And again, this feels like it makes no sense. John sees the lamb. He takes the scroll from the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. Then he hears, right, the four living creatures and the 24 elders of all creation cry out, worthy, Jesus Christ is worthy to open the scroll and break its seal because he was slain. Not because he's the creator, which he is. Not because he is risen from the dead, which he is. But because he was slain. He won the victory when he was slain. In the very center of the throne, says John, Jesus Christ, the crucified Savior, stands in the very center of the throne of the, uni the universe. How can that be? Like, how can that be? Given that the fact that the Almighty, he's sitting on the throne. The Almighty is on the throne. But how is Jesus at the center of the throne? And this lies the greatest revelation of the, of the book of Revelation. Jesus Christ, the crucified, he stands at the center of the throne because he stands at the center of the Almighty God. Jesus Christ comes from and lives in the very center of the living God. So for those who look around and at God and say he's unjust, unkind, and unloving, and it's hard to rectify him, at the very center of God stands Jesus. At the very center of him stands Jesus. 
So the heart of the Almighty is the heart of the Lamb. Heart to be slain, a heart to be sacrificed, a heart to lay down his life for others. So the Lion and the Almighty overcomes by being a Lamb. See, the Lion does not get to the throne by being a Lion. The secret of history, which no one could have discovered on his or her own, is that the lion gets to the throne by being the lamb. Listen, how does our world say that we should get to the throne? How does our world say that we should get promotions or becoming the best? It says you should be out there being ruthless to get to the top. Our culture says that you need to attack. You can always assume someone's coming after you, coming after your job. They're trying to do better than you. Or as for any teens in this room, right? You know what, the, what my son is saying and what he's hearing right now is say that you need to be a dog. Dog spelled D-A-W-G because that's the cool way you spell it, you know what? And so you have to be, you have to be a bit ruthless. You have to go at it. But not Jesus. And for those who feel threatened by God, know that the heart of God is Jesus. So whenever we see or feel about God, we can see Jesus. The way he lived and walked and served and know that that is the heart of God. The lion wins by being slaughtered. Again, the lamb is not stupid. It has seven eyes. The lamb is not a wimp. It has seven horns, which is a complete strength. So what the vision of Revelation 5 is telling us is this, is that the power that overcomes is the weakness of sacrificial love. And the wisdom that overcomes is the foolishness of sacrificial love. And that is what the Apostle Paul is getting at in 1 Corinthians 1.24, where Paul calls Jesus Christ crucified the power of God and the wisdom of God. And Paul goes on to say that if the rulers of this age had understood God's foolish wisdom and weak power, they would have never crucified Jesus. Why? Because when they crucified him, they lost. Evil unleashed all of its evil on Jesus and his weakness and his foolishness is what the world thought. And it lost. The lion has overcome Finally, and I turned and I saw a lamb as if slain. Does it make no sense? Is there a more startling juxtaposition of images that we can think of? Listen, there's so many stories of sacrifice. There, the idea is of sacrifice is someone loses, so someone or a team, right, can gain, so it, they can win. So uh, my kids like to have water balloon fights, and so they'll usually break off into two teams. Uh, and so there's one water balloon fight that happened, and you know, Jude and Malachi came in, and Jude was completely completely wet. Like, it was unbelievable. How, I th they felt like he was in a tsunami. And so then Malachi walks into completely dry. And I was like, what? You guys just have a water balloon fight against each other? He's like, no, Jude and I were on a team. Jude went out to be the sacrifice. <laughs> and then Jude stops and he looks at me and he was like, it was awesome. And so like, he was like, it was totally worth it. And so he took the sacrifice for the team, for the game. And you know what? He found it joy to be the sacrifice. He's like, we won. They had no chance. He's like, I laid there in a puddle of pain while, they, I, while Malachi berated them all with the water balloons. One of my favorite quotes I've heard is by Bruce Metzger, and he puts it this way. Instead of a ferocious lion that hurts others, the Messiah is a sacrificial lamb that takes into himself the hurt of others. And the total opposite of our world. The total opposite of maybe what we sometimes feel with God, but we have to recognize that Jesus is at the center of his heart. He comes as a lamb. That is the secret of history. That is what the scroll contains, the revelation that Almighty God brings the kingdom of heaven to earth through sacrificial love. Instead of a ferocious lion who hurts others, Jesus Christ, the lamb, overcomes by taking the hurt of others onto himself. And with that, Jesus at the center 
This worship breaks out that we see in Revelation 5. And this is this. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth. Then I looked and heard the voices of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the loud voice they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all of them in, is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. This song declares three things about us who follow the Lamb. We are purchased, we are made a kingdom of priests and we'll reign with him. The overarching theme is this, is that we'll reign with him. That they will reign with him. Have the present tense. They reign with him. Two of the best commentators on Revelation, or two of, you know, the, one of the, the, two of the most known commentators on Revelation, Gerard Grodel and G.K. Beale, argue that the correct reading is not the future will reign, but the present reign. The Lamb reigns even now. And surprise, the Lamb's followers reign even with him now. That is the central point of Revelation 4 and 5. The Lamb is on the throne now. So John can say in 1, 5, in Revelation 1, 5, that Jesus Christ is the ruler of the kingdoms of earth. Now, the question to give to you, for you to really wrestle with, and help you understand, and even at the starting point, right? We have to get to the starting point, because if we feel... You know what? That we don't agree with something at the beginning, then however we, whatever we hear after, it's going to go back to what we truly believe. Do you believe that he reigns now? Do you believe that he reigns now? Everything hinges on that answer. Already the slain and resurrected lamb sits on the throne. He reigns over the universe. And so we know this and we see this. And even as we see throughout Revelation in the Bible, it says this. Jesus says to the church in Thyatira, I have received authority over the nations from my father. So he's echoing Psalm 2, where God says he will give the nations all the inheritance to his son. Jesus says to the church in Laodicea, hey, listen, I have overcome and sit with my father on his throne. Jesus has already been installed on the throne. This claim is affirmed by the rest of the New Testament. Like, for example, Acts 2. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, he declares this, that Jesus, God, raised up again, therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God. Ephesians 1, Paul declares that God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come, God put all things in subjection under his feet. So he reigns now. We have to believe that at the beginning, at the starting point. He does reign right now, even though sometimes it feels like it's not. He reigns. He's there. Now, but how does the lamb reign in the world right now? See, the lamb again. And this is the thing you take. The lamb reigns as the lamb, not as the lion. The lion, the almighty, reigns in the world as the lamb. Not as the ferocious lion who hurts people to assert his rule, but who takes into himself the hurt of others, thereby making his rule happen. See, the secret of God's victory on the cross is the secret over all other victories. God overcomes by suffering, suffering with and for the world. Come, let's look at the slain lamb on the throne. That vision has to be central. Listen, I wish I could tell you that he reigns like a lion. And sometimes we want that. We want things overthrown. We want people fierce and ferocious in that kind of space. But he has chosen a different way. To overcome evil by walking right into it, which is bold like a lion, 
confronting it with his truth, and if, he need, and if need be, taking all the evil, though, that is dished out, thereby diffusing it. Jesus Christ reigns now that he, now the, Jesus Christ reigns now the way he did during his incarnation. We have to think about that. The way he reigns now, we have to look at the Gospels and see how he reigns. That's a picture of how he reigns. He reigns by entering in to situation, taking into himself the suffering of the world. He reigns from the cross. The Lamb reigns through us, his followers. That's how he reigns. And we reign with him in the same way, not as lions, but as lambs. The cross is not only the ground of our salvation, it is also the pattern of our salvation, the way of our salvation. The cross is the throne from which he reigns. And he calls us to join him on his throne. He calls us to take up the cross daily. It is the way he makes the kingdom of heaven come to earth. And this is what we are called to do. This is how we're called to reign with him as lambs. The way that we can reign is first by being a witness to the Lamb. John calls Jesus to be a faithful witness three times in the book of Revelation. Listen, this is what we're called to be, a faithful witness to the Lamb. We are called to go out there, and even we know in the Great Commission to go out and to share of the good news of Jesus Christ, the sacrificial Lamb for the whole world, the one who reigns with peace, the one who we can see who came and walked through the Gospels and know and trust that this is the way that He wants us to live. This is the way that He's going to save the world. That he reigns as a sacrificial, he reigns as a slain lamb. Second, reigning with the lamb involves intercession. He is the greatest intercessor and calls us to join him in that priestly work. Before John hears the song Worthy, he sees golden bowls of incense, which he says are the prayers of the saints. As priests in a priestly kingdom, we reign by bringing the world to the throne through our prayers. And so prayer is a mighty, mighty way that we are to bring, you know what, the kingdom here on earth. And so we need to be a praying people. It's just not something we say because, you know, it's the thing that you're supposed to do. But there's power when you pray. And listen, as we see throughout Acts and as we see throughout the whole New Testament, all movements that started, started with prayer. They recognize where their power needed to come from. And that's where it is, through intercessing, through prayer. And so we help bring the rain as we pray. Now, that's not a rain dance I'm talking about here. As you know, I'm talking about a different rain. You know, they just said that, and they just came out in my mind. I processed it. Anyways, welcome to the beautiful mind of Jeremy. And so um, <clears throat> witness and intercession then come together in this third beautiful way that we reign with the Lamb. We reign through sacrifice. Through dying, in the cause of his, uh, through dying in the cause of his apparently weak and foolish kingdom, we reign through sacrifice. Bearing witness to the truth can be dangerous business. It can be dangerous business when you are a witness to the truth. And I think we can see that in our current day and age as we bring truth, it's met with much restraint in much anger. It's tricky business. Interceding for the enemy, because uh, the, the world views us as the enemy, it can be dangerous business too. Especially when this truth is not welcomed. When the truth is experienced as a threat. Which it is to everything out of phase with the kingdom that they're trying to build. The Greek word for witness is martis. It is no, not an accident that is the root word for martyr. Witnesses often turn into martyrs. And as disciples from other parts in the world will tell us, listen, we will probably not become faithful witnesses unless we are willing to be martyred, unless we are willing to suffer loss for the sake of the truth. Are we willing to suffer loss for the sake of the truth? That's what reigning like the lamb is about. That's what reigning, we take on the weight and the pain. The Lamb reigns by, reigns by entering into the hurts of the world and taking them into himself. And so do the Lamb's followers. I'm sorry. 
This is how the kingdom will reign. We choose to do as he does. We walk into the face of evil, declare the truth. We intercede for mercy and take whatever comes. We will sacrifice for the cause. Evil is overcome only one way. Evil is only overcome one way that we've seen. By the power of sacrificial goodness. That is the only way evil will be overcome. Evil is not overcome by more evil. By playing their game. Evil begets more evil. Violence begets more violence. Hatred begets more hatred. We are known by the love, by our love. Only sacrificial goodness can finally stop evil in its tracks. We do not overcome the evil of history by echoing evil, by playing the evil's games on their terms. We overcome by speaking the truth, by blessing the enemy. Worship team, I'm going to call you up. And uh, as I close, we're going to prepare to take communion. I think how fitting as we hear this message today about sacrificial love and about the sacrificial lamb, that we take this and it maybe brings a whole new light as we take of the bread and we take of the, the wine today, aka grape juice, and we remember how we are going to see evil overcome in this world. And we see it that it's by the one reigning slain lamb on the throne. Evil will will be overcome by sacrifice. Evil is only defeated when it's outmatched by sacrificial goodness. Goodness that is willing to go all the way. Let's stand together. If this is your first time here, um, how we take communion is that uh, there'll be elements in the back and elements in the front here. So we encourage you to um, go to either space uh, to grab them as you grab your elements. Uh, I encourage you to sit, to reflect, and, and to, uh, to wake as we take it together as a one body um, and to celebrate and to remember what Christ has done. And as I encourage you, as we wait, let this resonate today. And we want, listen, he is the lion. He is the lamb. He is both bold, but he is both sacrificial too. And this picture in Revelation 5 is the center of how everything is going to play out. From this throne room, and we see the one who has the power over history, over everything. It's not this lion that we want to picture who's going to come and be, just feels like it rip everything apart, tear it all down. But it's a sacrificial lamb, a slain lamb that's on the throne. That should bring us peace as we think about our future, as we think about the future of the world. And as we've already seen the story of Jesus play out and how he ruled and how he walked the earth, we should have peace as we move and walk the rest of these days that we have here as we wait the return of our King. So, I'm going to pray, and after I'm done praying, I encourage you to go to the back and to the front to grab the elements. Father, we thank you, Lord, that uh, Revelation 5 paints the picture that we are to center on in Revelation. None of it makes sense without you, Jesus. That's still the story. None of this makes sense without you, Jesus. Just as we read maybe the Old Testament as we navigated and walked it through, and like, what is happening? And then we get to the Gospels and we see you, Jesus. And we're like, okay, I get it. And we see the story begin to play out, how your church is growing, how you're calling people back to you. Then we know there's another time you're returning, but then At the center of Revelation 5, we see a slain lamb. That should bring us peace. That should help us to know how we're to bring the kingdom here too. Like you did. By being witnesses, by interceding, by 
sacrifice. So as we reflect on your sacrifice, Lord, when you came and what it meant for us, Lord, let us hold on to it. Let us grasp it. Let us love it. Let's speak to us, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.